All right, welcome everybody to Forging Brains Podcast. I'm Riley Kirkpatrick here with my co host Gavin Cooper. And today we got a special guest. We got Bill Poor. Bill Poor is a hey, world champion. He's also world champion in the horseshoeing world. Bill's also got some uh, some other titles under his belt. He's also he can shoot three miles, so he's not a guy to really piss off. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, thanks for joining us today. Oh. Yeah, How's thank you, God. Glad. Thanks for having me. <clears throat> what have you but, been up to lately then, Bill? Well, here lately I've just been uh, making Damascus for other knife makers and then uh, making a lot of uh, different knives. I, I got a few orders uh, I need to get done, and then I try to get something that I enjoy making in, in between orders. And then uh, sometimes we either have a – a waffle or an auction or or uh or just see if anybody can't live without it and post it on facebook <laughs> yeah some of them knives you make are pretty dang pretty dang sick well we appreciate it yeah we really enjoy making it uh it was a really uh uh advantage uh to me when dad wanted to start learning how to make knives and uh and so what we did was we had uh all the best knife makers in the world uh, and we had them come to the shop one at a time and we, uh, uh, had like 10 or 20 guys pay for their way. And then me and dad got to clinic for free. So, uh, so it was, it really helped, uh, my ability to, to do what I do by, you know, seeing Bill Burke or Rick Dunkery and, and some of the greatest master smiths in the world, you know, come to the shop and, and give us lessons. So that, that helped a bunch. Well, I bet. Cause it, it, like I remember like you guys were just kind of starting and you guys were like making, starting some feather Damascus and stuff like that. And then all of a sudden it just went wild. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the guy that lives up there by you, Riley, uh, uh, I think he said some good words about me on a podcast the other day, but I definitely got to return the favor. But Mr. Solemn Straub is a, is a very, uh, a wizard with yeah. uh, steel. And uh, a lot of my mosaic patterns, I, I learned from him and then reading the books. And then, and then uh, of course, you know, Bill Burke and Rick Dunkery learned uh, quite a bit from them as well. Yeah, that's, that has been a crazy thing. And so do you think when you're making the Damascus, do you, is it more worthwhile to make the Damascus and sell it as bar stock? Like sell it as stock or to make it into well, a it's, I, I, th- I think uh, uh, if you know, if you enjoy it, it doesn't matter. I enjoy both of them, but it's definitely easier to just make the Damascus and sell it to knife makers, you know, um, uh, just on account. It's really fun to make the steel, but it's also when you see something cool that you made, it's, it's fun to go ahead and make a buoy out of it or whatever. And then, you know, you could probably triple your price by going ahead and making a knife out of it. But, uh, but you got to, you know, just have that, uh, that uh, time time correct yeah <clears throat> yeah i didn't even know that there was like yeah. a big market for just building billets of Damascus and then selling it to people i had i had no idea until uh you know we made a a couple of uh pocket knife you know uh, i think the money is uh, at is there's a lot of pocket knife makers i had no idea and, and uh to sell damascus to pocket knife guys and you can make like at least 15 maybe even 20 pieces of of uh steel for for pocket knives out of one billet and it, it makes it worth the while if you can sell each one of those for two or three hundred dollars each you know if you got you know i sold a couple of billets for you know 200 250 each thing and got like 15 uh blades out of one you know piece of billet so it makes oh, wow. it worth it. yeah yeah and you so start how long with, does it kind of take to make a uh, billet then well you start with about um a uh, hundred bucks worth of steel and then uh, and then uh um it takes to make a just a decent feather pattern. It's it's four welds, so you've got four welds. But you have to each welding heat. You've got to cut it in, into five sections, and you have to surface grind it as clean as you can on both sides, uh, and then stack it all back together, and then arc weld it on the ends so it stays together, and then forge weld it, and then draw it back out to where you can cut it into five more pieces. And it takes five times, and on I mean, excuse me, four times, and on the fourth weld. You can split it down the center and, and go ahead and weld it back up. So you have one more welding heat because 
Some guys uh, take that chance and go ahead and weld it back together without cleaning it up, but you definitely want to go ahead and split it in half and clean both sides on the middle, and it makes for a whole lot better weld on the inside. You won't ever have a crack from the feather in the in the center there if you go ahead yeah, and clean it up. Yeah, that's risky business. Yeah. Just go ahead and, like, you've done so mm -hmm. much work to that point yeah, to just, like, ah, yeah. oh, I'm just going to flap her yeah. to death. That's why jelly, jelly Roll Damascus is the worst Damascus ever is because there's no entire way to cleaning it up before you try and weld it back together. So it's 50-50 whether you get it to weld or not. Yeah. Yeah. And the Jelly Roll, it's just rolled up on top of itself, yeah. right? Right, and so there's no way to clean the slag or anything out of there when you roll it up <laughs> oh, <laughs> before damn. you weld it back up. So it, it's really 50-50 uh, whether you get that weld or not on Jelly Roll Damascus. And it's so Damascus, funny, too, because, you know? like, from a horseshoeing standpoint, I don't give a shit. I'll slap a weld together. It's pretty dirty, yeah. really. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. And sometimes when we weld just bar shoes every day, you know, on the horse or whatever, you know, it's, it's you know, as, as long as uh, you got a little sure weld and then soak it and lap over a little extra steel, it should weld most of the time. If it doesn't, we'll just go over and arc <laughs> weld it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it ain't necessarily got to be pretty. I mean, <laughs> as long as it holds. But then it goes right. to Damascus, and it's like every all of a sudden everything gets surgical. It's getting cleaned. Like, it's getting care. Like, it's all, right. it's all special all of a sudden, you know? It's a funny mindset switch. Right, right. But, Do uh, you have, like, a uh, favorite pattern to make? Uh, probably the Gorgon flower. Uh, you know, it's, it's everybody always likes it. And, uh, and, and Solemn actually, uh, posted a step-by-step -step on his page and I was lucky enough to catch it. And, and, uh, when he, when he did post it and, and I really took note of it, of, of each step of how to make it. It's, it's about six welds. And, and then you have a couple of, uh, forging on the bias. Uh, a lot of people don't know what that is, but that's forging a, every pattern that is in a piece of square and forging it 45 degrees uh, and so what I do to accomplish that is so if your pattern is in a piece of square stock and then I take another piece of square stock to weld on for my stick and I put the point up on the flat of the square and then that tells me where I need to forge to so I, I take everything on the square and I forge it to 45 degrees where it's even with that square stock that I I put on the end to weld it. That's a kind of a, a good, uh, what do you call, a, a measuring tool to, where you know exactly where to forge to. Yeah, it kind of makes sense. Yeah. How yeah. long does it take you to make a billet of that, that pattern? Uh, probably two days because you have to, you know, I, the, probably the fastest I can make a billet is about two days because I can probably only get three welds in per day. And so I was looking at six welds, and so so it would uh, you could you have to sit there and wait for it to cool down. And then if you did it properly and you wanted it to be really easy on your uh, blades, um, sometimes we're a little bit lazy and we just let them cool off really slow in the forge, and then we get them back up in a couple hours. But the proper way to do it would be to put it in the oven after every weld to 1200 degrees and let it cool down very slow. And so you would probably take you all week to make a billet if you really wanted to be nice to your tools and yeah. kneel each, each weld before you cut and it. And that's just and being then, nice. You know, your blades will last much longer. That's just being longer. nice to like the bandsaw yeah. in the mill or. Right. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Cause those, those bandsaw blades are about a hundred bucks a piece. And, uh, and when we have one of those Damascus clinics in, in here and then, Everybody didn't quite anneal their steel uh, uh, properly, and and they're and we're and we're we're kind of blowing through it. We, we'll eat one of those blades up, cutting everybody's billets in about a weekend, and it's gone. Hundred dollar blade, <laughs> you know. <laughs> How long would one of those blades last? Like if you were being nice to the steel and like annealing it properly? Oh, it would last all week or, or, or longer. You just keep cutting if if the steel was annealed. Uh, yeah. you know, 1200 degrees and let it cool down for three hours after it heated up to 1200, then that blade would last forever, you know, cause it has coolant and everything else. But whenever you're hard on it and you make it cut hard, hard steel, you know, and, and, and not, uh, completely, uh, annealed it, it will eat those teeth up. Yeah. I bet. Oh, but you, you yeah. don't want to use L6 the damn hot is the saw worst though. Like, yeah. Yeah. 
If anybody ever hands you L6, you just tell them, you better make sure that it's annealed four times before you ever put it in your in your blade, you know, in your stall. <laughs> must it be them pretty damn hard, huh? Yeah. It is. Yeah, that stuff is... <laughs> yeah, they made the old saw yeah. blades out of it, some of them. Yeah. <clears throat> we got oh. a bunch of that stuff around mm-hmm. here from the wood mills, from like, uh, they use it for the planer mm-hmm. ba- blades, for the bandsaw blades yeah. and everything, oh. and it is, it's yeah. unreal, even when it's hot. Yeah, I think it was Kelly Vermeer... Kelly Vermeer brought a, a piece one time to dad and, 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 and she failed to mention that it was uh, not annealed and, and we put it in there to cut it on the saw and it knocked all the teeth off yep. in one go. So that was a hundred dollar blade just gone. Gone. <laughs> especially, especially on those big hydraulic fed saws. Like the feed doesn't yeah. care. It just oh, keeps yeah. bogging the teeth right into the wheel work. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, all right, here we go. <laughs> Just down. Yeah. <laughs> well, Bill, we kind yeah. of got off on a little uh, quick tangent there on where you're at now, but man, let's let's step it back. Of uh, what was it like growing up as Jim Poor's son? You know, uh, like well, <laughs> what man, was that like? Those are big. Those are big shoes to fill, and I probably will never <laughs> fill them. But uh, but I, I tell you what, uh, um, I've sure been a, a lucky lad to have a, a dad like Jim Poor and. And uh, always, always had uh, bar stock. Always had gas, so we were always able to practice, you know. And and uh, and you know, whenever Dad was competing on the American Farriers team, I think he was on there what six times or something like that. I think I only did it like four times. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was always a, a goal to try and uh, and try and uh, uh, you know make Daddy proud. Uh, always. Uh, was was one of the main goals and and trying to uh, and do it just as good as Dad did it. Um, About how old were you when he made the uh, American Farriers team the first time? Oh, uh, the first time I wasn't very old. I think it was 1989. Uh, I want to say maybe 88. Um, so I would have been about you know 12. Uh, I was okay. born in 76 uh, in Moscow, Idaho. My dad uh, oh, thought yeah. he wanted to be a logger for a little while, and uh, and so. Uh, I think uh, he had enough of the snow and the logs uh, when he was about 17, and we had come on back to to uh, Abilene, Texas, and uh, and um, and then we uh, we raced uh, we raced some motorcycles and did a lot of fun stuff. I sold my motorcycle gear and went to bull riding for a while. I thought I wanted to be a bull rider, and then didn't and, we uh, all? That it, that didn't work out very long, you know, and <laughs> and. Uh, and so I went back to the enduro racing. Me and Dad, we raced a lot of enduros and and did did fun stuff. So we we always, but our shop burnt down out in Potosi, and that kind of set us back for a little while. All of our motorcycles and all of Dad's blacksmith gear got oh, burned up. Yeah, that was a that was a bad deal. Uh, way back in the uh, in the uh, that would have been eighty six or eighty seven somewhere in there. But but Dad was uh, uh, that's when. They, you know, he got involved in the TPFA, and I was a little kid, about 1985, uh, about 10, 9 years old, and and then we uh, we got on on that, uh, and I just started learning how to shoe horses about 90, 91, I think. Uh, he sent me off to Jim Keith to go uh, uh, learn from Jim Keith, and maybe I'd respect him a little bit better when I got back. So, yeah. uh, and it definitely was, uh, worked. I kind of did the, uh, karate kid thing with Jim Keith. I helped him build a new horseshoeing school and, and, uh, we kind of did the wax on wax off deal and he taught me how to shoe horses and I painted the walls of his <laughs> new building and dug holes and, and, uh, and all that. So, um, and then, uh, and then as soon as that, we got back from that, that was like my f- sophomore year in high school. And then, and then the junior year, we got lucky to be the one of two to go on the culture exchange program. So I went to England and Scotland in the summer of uh, 94. While and, you were uh, still in high school? Oh, still in high school. Yeah, I, was, I, was, okay. I already knew I was going to be a horseshoer uh, before I went uh, into my eighth grade year of, of junior high. Oh, so, so you were I, set I already, on knew, it. I already knew that I was going to be a shoer as soon as I graduated high school. And, yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I already had that planned out. And so went to, went to England and Scotland and uh, hung out with some of the greatest farriers in the world, Billy Crothers, um, uh, the Balfours, um, uh, 
the list goes on. You know, uh, uh, David Smithy, and got to hang out with some great, great uh, farriers and learn, uh, two weeks at a time and learn how to shoe horses and and we did a little bit of beer drinking. So uh, you know, I went <laughs> over there with a, with a six pack and I come back with kind of a keg too. But I did learn how to shoe horses. You know. <laughs> So that was we had some good fun over there, and that that Guinness, you know, it's yeah. kind of fattening. Yeah. Oh yeah. Drink, drink a lot of that. Except you don't need a and, damn uh, dinner after you drink but, one. <laughs> so, so I so I finished high school um, in '95 and graduated, and then and then Dad, right as I was graduating high school, he decided that he was going to move back to Odessa from uh, Novice over here, and so he just kind of broke my plate. And said, "Oh, here's a full shoeing business, and I'm leaving." So, uh, oh. so I had a full shoeing business right out of high school, and uh, and just went to shoeing horses, and ended up uh, uh, still competing as we got out of high school, and uh, and we went. To, I think I first started going to Calgary. My first year was 1994. Uh, as soon as we got back from uh, from England, I think I think we were able to fly and go to Calgary. And then I and then I went to England after that. I can, I, I think that was uh, how that went. So and then, had you uh, been to uh, some horseshoeing contests while you were in high school still? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I I won I won all the forging at my first Oklahoma Division One contest, but I'd never shot a horse before. So really? I, so I had, I had Kirk Cottle and Jim Poor trying to teach me how to shoe a foot. Uh, in the shoe and, and I'd never, never done it. So my first shod foot was actually in a shoeing competition. Yeah. <laughs> you remember who the judge was? Uh, oh man, that's been a while. I, I bet dad or Glenn would know. Yeah, it yeah. was, yeah, it was, it was a long time ago. Yeah. Well, that's a hell of a trip. Shooting your first yeah. foot at a contest. Already, like, yeah. Where you win all you the forging. Were you already forging at yeah, we didn't, we didn't win shoeing. We we got sixth place, but but it was still a fun, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. awesome. So had you already yeah. been like forging quite a bit, like when you were a kid? Oh yeah, when Dad would have clinics, I would always be out there trying to trying to forge the same shoe that they were, and everything. You know, Dad had the American Fairs team over, you know, two or three times a year, and and they'd be practicing, and then uh, you know I'd be out there trying to trying to make the same shoes that they were and uh and and out there just giving it a go yeah, yeah. that's great and so well, i suppose the shoes shoes then are kind of like what they come out with sometimes on the like wcb list nowadays right like as so, far as some of the yeah yeah i mean it, you know it 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 kind of goes with you know everybody says you know you know it was my time back then you know that was kind of you know in the you know, 2007, 2008, whenever I was at my prime and my peak in the horseshoeing world, and, you know, it was it was kind of my time, and, you know, Craig's deal was coming in, and, and you know, everything just went well for me. You know, everywhere I went, I, I just kind of won, won the competition, and, uh, and uh, so that was kind of kind of my peak years was 2007 and 2008. Just everything went Bill Poor's way. And yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So... I think it was a lot, a lot of experience and a lot of hard and earned. You know, I wasn't, uh, I wasn't ever a very um, dedicated, you know, practice. You know, I didn't, you know, like Craig Tunker. You know, he used to practice like lots and lots, and I, and uh, and and I never, I never did practice that much. I was, I, you know, I made a few shoes and and I called it good. And then, but I think over my experience of going to all the competitions with dad and just that, that those two years, it kind of carried through, carried through. And, and I, and I was just the most experienced competitor there. And so it, so it, it kind of, uh, made, let me go ahead and win all those competitions those years. Yeah. Basically and, uh, because you started at such a young, right, young age. Right. Though. Yeah. And it was, it was just my, my years to shine, uh, during that because it was a, it was, <clears throat> Um, you know, we got really lucky at, at Calgary because, you know, Andrew casually, he's like top yeah. notch. Y'all know Andrew casually from England? Yep. Yeah. And, and that was his very first year to come to Calgary and he almost won it. I only beat him by one point, you know, <laughs> and it's one and only time to come to Calgary. <laughs> and you beat him. So yeah, he was reserving and just barely got around him. Yeah. You know. 
And well, then, that's uh, the thing is only one person is allowed to win. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that's it. Well, how hard was it when you uh, said your dad dumped the uh, shoeing business on you pretty much right out of high school then? Well, I guess we had to go to work, but uh, it was, it was you know, we'd already been shoeing quite a few horses through the senior year, and uh, I didn't have to do much school work. We were pretty lucky going to a small school, and I had most of all my, you know, the toss tests and all that done uh, through my junior year, so we didn't have to, I only made a lot of barbecue pits in, in ag class in my senior year to uh, <laughs> sell for the raffle so we could go on a senior trip. It oh, was yeah. a pretty small school, so. That's great. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. So have you like w- learning like has learning always been pretty easy for you of like learning like especially uh, things that take hand eye well, coordination? Yeah. I had I had an advantage that most people don't have is I always had somebody uh close by that I could just say, you know, I didn't have to make like you know, one time James Morgan um uh, uh made like a hundred pairs of these aluminum shoes. And, and dad, and he, and he paid dad and Grant Moon to come out there and, you know, Grant Moon, he picked up the first one and he picked up the last pair and they looked just alike. So he, he was practicing very, very stupid. And so I was very lucky. I never had to practice stupid. I always had somebody to look at my shoes, you know, and I could, I could you know, improve going to the next pair, you know, and the next, the next shoe because I had somebody to, to help me and I could, you know, always bring, bring a pair too. So people that doesn't have somebody right there. So it's, it's, it's harder to, to practice in my mind because they don't have anybody to look at their shoes right then. And then they end up making the exact same mistakes they did on the last pair. That would have so been I, like, I never a, had to go through that. Yeah. Would have been like a huge advantage in those days. Cause like, even when we were talking to your dad last week, just yeah. as far as like, he would say, uh, when he would try to find something, he'd have to wait for the next magazine to come out. Right. You know, and you know, it's just yeah, different. I didn't, I didn't have to have as much, uh, hardship as he did whenever he was practicing that's for sure yeah yeah that would be a huge advantage you know just having you know your dad yeah. there basically right and, and that he is you know, and that i always said that i you know i didn't i didn't uh i didn't deserve that that uh world champion trophy but i did win it and i was that was my proudest moment is uh because dad got second he got second uh twice going to that thing and he really wanted to win it and i I ended up uh, bringing that trophy to him, so that was my proudest moment. Yeah. So, uh, but it was just all the experience that paid off, and it was my my time to get around everybody. And, yeah. Uh, that's a tough, tough competition on Calgary. I wish they still had it. Yeah. Well, I think they're trying to bring something yeah. like that back now, right? With the Spruce yeah. Meadows deal. Yeah, that'll be. Yeah, yeah. What happened to that? I guess COVID shut yeah. it down, or. And, and it kind of – that's why we everybody could get going up yeah, there. Yeah, they're trying yeah. – they're, they're saying it's going to go again. So, that will be a cool deal. I, oh, and awesome. I don't know how, like uh, – Awesome. Yeah. Calgary's yeah. last year was my first year out of shoeing school. Yeah. Like, so it, it was, like, just bad timing for my for yeah. my life. Like, but it's, like, we right. always hear as, like, right. young guys right. now, like, that Calgary was the hardest. Yeah. And, like, yeah. would you – and like so, you base? you competed at WCB, and it's pretty much been the same format. You know, the hour long two shoes. Right. I was I was the guy who won won the first thing. First one was yeah. Craig's deal in 2008. I think is when it started. We had did the yeah. Road Runner, and then and then he did uh, six six competitions all over, and then and then I ended up winning five. And Travis Travis Coons won the one up in Durango uh, of the of the six that we had. Uh, Roy Bloom was judging that he made us make a bunch of little tinkering oh, really? shoes. And I ain't very good at little tinkering shoes. Yeah, only the roadsters and the draft shoes I shined at back then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I do. I do. Yeah. yeah. Roy's all about those yeah. old so that basically shoes. Last... <laughs> it was like... Yeah. I think one of my last competitions I competed at, I got I got to compete against Gavin there and he kicked my butt. Yeah. I think I, I know Texas Texas competition. I haven't I haven't oh, we we were still hitting oh, that up right. there for a few years. Yeah, you remember? Yeah. Yeah, now I remember. And I have I haven't competed in a while since then. Yeah, yeah. that's you competed yeah. the year me and your dad judged it. And that's, uh, oh, yeah. they do yeah, that yeah. class there where they have like you, like the open guy compete with a novice guy. Oh, and that's, okay. I, yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah. you I want remember. it. 
Yeah, yeah, I want, I want yep, that class. Yeah, like that yeah. was something your dad even told me then. He's like, Bill's always does good with somebody that's a novice to teach him. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I take, got to take charge and and make them hit it where you need to, need them to hit it at. That's for sure. Because uh, that was always a good fun competition. I think that's yeah. something probably is like, <clears throat> but you're able to break down what's going on. What easy you yeah. know you know it's like yeah. that that's something that's like really mm -hmm. hard for everybody it's like that they don't know where they want them to hit it they're just like do better you know right, <laughs> like, right. Yeah. quit screwing up yeah. here like, <laughs> yeah so how much of your yeah. horseshoeing stuff like in your way of learning horseshoeing how much did that transfer over into your shooting and, and the, yeah. in my shooting uh, just, just discipline and, and, uh, and, and cracking down, but, you know, shooting is a whole nother world. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess it was the, um, uh, there's a ranch out in Ben, uh, Ben was that, uh, Ben, uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it, but anyway, there's a ranch and they had a, a, a uh, you know, the guy had made a, a long shot. And, and, you know, and I read the whole thing and, you know, and a lot of people, um, you know, they're kind of an expedition shot and a lot of, you know, a lot of marksmen, they think they're all hoax and, and, um, but it's a lot of fun to try and shoot something a long ways away. And so we got into that and I built, I built a couple of targets and we started shooting as far as we possibly could with every rifle that we could find. And, and, uh, and, and then we, we got into the, and then the ELR, I held two ELR competitions, which are extreme long range. And I held two here in my local town. And then, and then, uh, and then the world kind of took off and then everybody wanted to shoot long range after that. And, uh, and I was the, the first guy to put two out of five shots on target at two miles away during competition. And then the, the very next weekend, three other guys did it. <laughs> Holy so God. yeah yeah i could not believe it you know and and um and and then once i did that and then i was uh, the first one to hit a target at three miles and then the first one to hit a target at 4.1 miles but it was Damn. it was uh yeah and we, we did a lot a lot of that but but the the expedition shots are they take a few more shots uh but but it's still just a lot of fun to try and accomplish a shot that far, you know. See, that's and, and, something you know, that like blows yeah. my mind, you know, because you can't necessarily from the naked eye see two miles away. Like, how do you even well, you'd like? You have to have a scope. Yeah, yeah, you would have to have a scope, and then and then we shot a target that was you know uh, forty eight by forty eight, so about four foot at three miles, and then we shot a target that was eight foot by eight foot at four point one miles. And then and essentially, it, like, if it hits anywhere on it, or are you trying to hit, like, I guess a bullseye? Just trying to hit anywhere on it, yeah, bas basically. And uh, and and uh, the technology over the years has come so far, because whenever I first started to make that three-mile shot, I built all my own rig to, to get up that high. And a lot of people thought it was, like, more MOA, but all it was was just a riser that I built for my action to put my scope on to be able to get over the barrel whenever the barrel's ang angled up that high. You know, oh. I wanted to get the, the view to be able to still see it without looking at your barrel through your scope. Yeah. <laughs> and so I built a lot of those, those mechanisms to, to, get, to get above the barrel. But now they have a, a prism, uh, which is all it is is a piece of glass. And, and you can put your scope on your normal height and then put that prism on there, and it automatically gives you 100 MOA uh, with just your same dial. So, And they even got ones, if you're going to go like really extreme, like three or four miles away, that actually um, works like a tank, like a tank driver. Because, you know, a tank, he, he's, where he's looking is, you know, not where he's actually looking through the tank, you know, like a periscope. They have one now that's a periscope that goes around the barrel. Okay. So you can put your you put your dope in there, and then it goes around the barrel, so you can have your barrel wherever you want. But the actual glass where you're looking is around the barrel. Yeah, That's it's called correct. Charlie Charlie Tyron, uh, Tacron. They're they're pretty awesome too as well. So now it's kind of like, like so, the first guy did a backflip on a motor on a motorcycle. Like it's just like 
Like, it's, oh, man. Yeah, Travis like, Pastrana, all of a sudden, man. Like, man, it's possible. <laughs> now look at all of them. Yeah. So that was kind of what it was when people started hitting miles away. It was like, this is no yeah, big deal. Yeah, yeah. No, and, w- and once people, you know, uh, kind of figured it can be done, well, you know, and 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 it's just like horseshoeing, uh, you know, you know, <clears throat> mine's bigger, you know. Everybody wanted to be that guy who does it a little bit better, you know, and so so you know, spirit of competition, shooting world. It, oh my God, the egos yeah. are huge, and everybody wants to be oh, a little bad. bit further, a little bit bigger, and so mm-hmm. they would build. I, I have heard of more calibers in the last five years that come out that it's unbelievable but the new caliber that uh, i've got two buddies that are just killing the elr world right now and it's called a um a a 416 hellfire and it's shooting a longer um uh, case bullet of a shy tack case um and and it's uh shooting a 416 bullet out of it so and you're shooting a normal large rifle primer out of it and it's extremely accurate i had a guy that I was spotting for in Raton, and he hit almost every target from uh, a mile all the way to a mile and a half. Every and shot. How big? How big a target? So are those? There? Yeah. They're shooting 36 by 36, three foot plates. Three foot. And, uh, and he hit almost every target to to, to about 2,900 yards. That's a that's a little over a mile and a half. And, he and are all those rounds being shot. like handmade at that point? Yeah, five five shots at each one, and so I was like, "You're the easiest guy I've ever spotted for." I didn't have to tell you nothing. You just, <laughs> I just said, "Keep doing that." <laughs> Do it again. Do it again. Do it. <laughs> Pull it again. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, and it's it's always so crazy so, to me with guns that it's like, in a way, it's scientific, right? You know, like all this is engineered, mm-hmm. but then it comes down to the oh, yeah. dude pulling the trigger. Right, right. And if, if you've done all your homework and you know where those rounds are going to go when they come out of that barrel, you know how fast they're going, you know the humidity and you know the wind, and if you've got it figured out and once you, you know, uh, even if you don't make a first round impact, then it, normally you have five rounds at each target. And, you know, the target started a mile away, so it's not like it's chump change. Yeah. It's a mile away. Yeah. That's a long shot. And, oh, yeah. uh, but these rifles are built to shoot that far, you know, like your normal 6.5 Creedmoor is going to run out of uh, uh, speed at a mile and a half. So, you know, it, it's only supersonic to about 1,100 yards, and it's going to start to lose speed. These rifles um, uh, are still supersonic at 2,400 yards away. So, so it's, you know, at a mile is only 1,760, so these rifles are meant to be able to hit a mile and, and a mile and a half shot is because they're still going supersonic speed with that big of a projectile. Yeah. So are the barrels like longer than like a normal yeah, rifle? Yeah, though? 36 inch barrels, normally minimum. Jeez. And and they're normally spinning a copper bullet, a 400 plus grain oh. copper bullet at, 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 a, at one and eight twists, you know, and they're normally coming out to 3,000 to 3,200 so feet now, per break, second. Break that down for people wow. that like compare that to like a normal 6.5. Well, a 6.5 usually has a one and eight twist, but it's only shooting 140 grain bullet at 2750. Uh, out of like a 20 you know, inch, 21 so, inch barrel. And, and you know, and even the diehard 308 fans, you know, I brought a 308 and a 6.5 Creedmoor to a competition and they let me shoot both rifles. And I actually outshot myself in the same match with a 6.5 than I did a 308. And you're shooting a bigger bullet out of a 308, 175 grain at 2650. Shooting a little lighter bullet out of 6.5, 140 grain at 2750. I have no idea. I still can't tell you why 6.5 shoots better, but it does all day long than a 308. Is it just a little bit flatter? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah it's just flatter, and it, it cuts through the wind. I don't and know so what is it that is what about they're that trying caliber, to do with those definitely... like the ELR cartridges. They're just trying to get them flatter. Right. Yeah. Well, they they just want to they want it to be able to be supersonic to you know at least a mile and a half, and they and they uh, and that way you can shoot a two mile target and not have any problem. You know that's why we're shooting a lot of two mile targets at Raton is because it's 66 feet above sea level, 6600 feet above sea level, 
up there. And so anywhere you're at a higher altitude, the bullet's going to travel uh, flatter and faster. So. Okay. It's because the air is thinner, essentially, right? right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that so makes sense. How, uh, do you know how fast your bullet was going when it hit at four miles? Yeah, it was moving about 700 feet per second. So still not yeah. nothing, and but... <laughs> Not, but it still would hurt. It would still knock a tree branch off, you know, a small tree branch off of a tree. It, it still had enough power of that because the guys At that the were sitting out there. Impact. Yeah, yeah, they were hearing they were hearing the tree over the target, you know, getting some branches knocked off of it. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> so, so the bullet was going through the trees as it was coming down, and then it still hit the target. Right, right. Well, saying. I was I actually. Shot quite a few at the four mile, and uh, and it was we had a few go over the target oh. and into the trees, and so that we had guys down there, you know, in metal. I made some AR five hundred, you know, little metal tents that, that if the bullet hit, you know, they would just ricochet off where they could see where my bullets were going. <laughs> we had them on, you know, calm. so yeah. they're sitting in these little huts, yeah. brave soul. In these little huts, <laughs> staring little at little huts that had AR-500 steel on there. Yeah. How far away are they from your target? <laughs> well, they were only like 50 yards from the from the target. Yeah. <laughs> they were four miles yeah. from me. You know. <laughs> but are they not worried about it hitting the target and then coming back to the hut from the front? I don't think the bullet would have enough okay. ump to actually bounce <laughs> off and come back. So I. And it was a plowed field, so most of the bullets were going to hit yeah. you know, in the dirt. That's yeah. so like. Mm. Yeah. How high is that bullet at its peak? That's Man, something I'm wondering. I've tried to figure that out a couple times, but but we tried to, a couple of different loads of some other bullets the same day, and it didn't matter how high you you put them at. It, about 500 yards short of that target, they would just like hit a wall and and go right down in the field. You know, so they was like hitting a wall and and they would just run out of steam about, you know, about uh, three and a half miles and just and just and just coming down. Yeah. So That's how much pitch or how much pitch or angle are you having to like point the barrel up to get it? Well, you know, Ma max ordin ordinance, you know, is, uh, you know, the match of, of an arrow, you know, as 35 degrees, you know, so. You know, you could get a barrel a little bit higher, but you know, you're only going to get so much uh, of the of the angle there. And and um, I can't tell you, I, I really wasn't that smart on all the angles and and all that. But we we got in there and just rednecked it most of the time and had fun. And and uh, and and I had some of the best guys in the world always uh, near me, giving me all their their feedback and information. Chase Stroud, he's a great precision guy and. And uh, we did it down there in Hearn. So one of the, it's very hard to find a place uh, where we live that you can shoot four miles legally uh, without crossing, you know, high lines or, That's or county roads or whatever. Too. And so we had to go down to Hearn, Texas. And you know how high Hearn is above sea level? About 300 feet. So oh, dang. <laughs> That's like us. So <laughs> it's a pretty bad spot to try and shoot that far, uh, you know, at the lowest elevation there is. And uh, – and, but I, some guys actually just uh, uh, beat all my records. And another guy that shoots a lot of long stuff is uh, in, uh, in Wyoming. He found a place, and, uh, and they did 4.4 uh, miles. Now, I don't know. I'm, I can't remember how many shots they said it took, 60-something 60, 60 shots. But it was just an expedition, a lot of fun. Took a few shots. But, hey, they got it done, and they, they were shooting at, you know, 5,500 feet above sea level. So definitely – That was an uh, advantage. Place to try what, and shoot what, that far. What cartridge? So is there? I I believe they were shooting a uh, a four sixteen Barrett. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there like a um? Shit! Now I lost my train of thought. Like a world uh, record? That no, Guinness would never uh, do any of the expeditions shots or any of the world record shots because they said there was too many variables for the record book with a scoped rifle. They they will put records in for unscoped rifles, but I mean, what are you gonna do? Shoot a thousand yards with a, with with no scope? You know, yeah. that's not. It, nobody's gonna. You know, I'm I'm sure that would be an awesome shot. You know, you know, uh, open sights, but uh, but uh, but but uh, but as far as scoped rifles, Guinness never would never would accept any of them. Really? So, uh, 
Yeah, we called Guinness several, even the news people whenever I first did one of the first ones. Um, but but yeah, Guinness wouldn't wouldn't get involved in any of the any of the. So but it there's got to be you know, like kind of in, uh, in the shooting world there, like. Well, yeah, I mean, there's there's records. Uh, you know, guys shot the smallest group at a thousand yards. You know, I think there was a, a one actually broke this last year. You know, and and I don't remember how small it was, but you know, we're talking you know five inches at a thousand yards with ten shots. You know, is pretty yeah impressive. Yeah, that's yeah. doing stuff. Yeah, because uh, how heavy are these rifles usually? Well, most of the ELR rifles are going to be 40 <laughs> to 50 pounds. Yeah, they're not going to be something you want to hike up the Colorado they're hill. They're sandbags. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, and I've tried to be, you know, um, with Jim Quick or John McNerney and try to hike up those hills, and I, I didn't make it, you know, 500 you feet. To. You know, I need a smaller <laughs> rifle. You'll shoot them from <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> If, you, if I can make it to the top of the mountain, then we might be able to shoot them yeah. from a long ways away, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah. How how long does it take for a bullet to get, like, like even, like, the four mile? Well, well three miles at at about 3,000 elevation, uh, it, it, would take, it would take 14 seconds. So it would take 10 wow. seconds. It would take 10 seconds for the guy who was standing next to the target to hear the shot. And then, and then uh, he would hear it. And then four seconds later, he would hear it hit the ground or hit the target. So he would see, you know, it. Yeah. Yeah, That's a trip. 14 seconds (laughs) in flight. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 14 seconds in flight on three mile shot. And then a four mile shot. I do believe uh, the guy said it took uh, 20, 20 seconds for it to get down there. So when he's yeah. four miles away, can he hear your gun being fired at that point? Oh, yeah, and you have the option to move or not, or stay where you're put, you know, but yeah. <laughs> you got to take that chance. If, <laughs> if you can hear that from four but, miles away and know it, it's coming. But it, but if you, if, you, if you heard the shot or you saw the shot, you know, and then you would have time to move. That's why... You know, Carlos, Carlos Hathcock, you know, shot that uh, old boy a couple of miles away uh, that was a general, you know, the old, the old famous story. But, but Carlos said he would have missed him, but the guy actually heard the shot, but he stood up. If he just would have stayed down, the shot would have missed him. But he heard the yeah. shot, and he stood up, and it went boom. <laughs> oh, no. Did it kill him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was oh. a – I didn't know about this story. Yeah, it's a famous sniper shot, but the guy, he actually heard the shot and he stood up and and then it hit him. Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. I forget what that is. I think it's called Marine Sniper or something like that, but it's like the guy, yeah, he has the most confirmed sniper kills in the Marine Corps. Yeah. He had a huge 50 cal machine gun that he had like put a scope on. He had that thing zeroed at a mile. A Weaver scope. Yeah. Yeah. He was just. He was yeah. a killer. Wow. <laughs> he was. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so the person yeah. he dropped was yeah. basically the enemy. Right. Yeah, he was oh, okay. the enemy. Yeah. yeah. I thought he it was, was a, uh, was a kind general of like a friendly <laughs> deal. Like he yeah. Yeah. No friendly <laughs> deal, <laughs> so, man. I'm pretty sure it was Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not friendly. Not friendly. Yeah. <laughs> That's a, it was it was pretty funny. There's a there's a series of famous books by this guy named Jack Carr, and he has a, uh-huh. a part in the book where he's talking about like how the FBI guarantee has people on like a, a little bit of a list that they're always checking on, and in that list he mentions you. Right. He's like like there's this guy in, yeah. in Texas that has just sh- like shot at three miles. <laughs> like guarantee they're watching him. Right. And I was like, they, yeah, they probably are watching Will <laughs> Porter. <laughs> <laughs> because I, yeah, you wonder yeah. of like yeah that was- that's why i asked you how high those bullets go is like how much longer before yeah. the f the faa is like all right you guys like you're getting into the flight mm. like in the planes you know like do you do you worry guys worry about that when you're out yeah, shooting I- of like yeah I don't, I don't think they would get that that high in the, in the flight zone you know 
but uh you know we're, we're only talking you know two or three hundred yards you know okay. it'd be uh, it's in the, okay and that yeah. that's, yeah. that's not yeah. as bad as i was thinking yeah yeah no 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 so no. you do much so then you still? do much do you do much shooting still do what I, I'm going to take a break this year. Yeah, I, I was going and blowing last year and spending all my money and, and going to shooting competitions. But, you know, they're just like uh, they, they don't pay very good. And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and like a horseshoeing competition. Yeah, yeah. And anyway, <laughs> my, my dad's talking like he's going to – I'm not going to say anything over the Internet what, he, what he's planning on doing. But anyway, I had to kind of get in the gear because uh, – because I need to get a shop done, so uh, we built some living quarters and we tore down my old house, and um, and I'm gonna uh, build a shop in front there where uh-huh. I can make my knives oh, off my sweet. place. So we, we've been we've been hot and heavy on that. Yeah, yeah. We just got my old house torn down. The the last load uh, uh, was taken away yesterday, so now we have room to come forward off of the living quarters and build the the shop. How far yeah. away do you live from uh, your dad's shop right now? Oh, only about two miles. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it's just nice. downtown Tuscola. He lives just on the outside skirts of Tuscola here. Yeah. He's actually outside of city limits, and I'm in city limits, so I get all the discounts for everything. Yeah, the trash can <laughs> was all discounted because it's in the city limits and all kinds of stuff. Oh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, I, I guess yeah. I've, I've never mm-hmm. been to town when I've been to your dad's place. I always feel like I'm yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tuscola, there's a little bit of town there. We got a Mexican food joint and Allsup's oh, and a perfect. Subway and and a burger joint and uh, and then a and they were uh, state champions, three uh, A state champions last year. So there's a lot of new folks moving in and a lot of new houses going up around the area. So it's know. on the up and up then. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. you. So what does your uh, shoeing business kind of consist of? all now are you just basically like Um, shooting a lot of western horses or i I only have maybe uh five accounts now so (laughs) and most of them are trims and most of them are just pets so uh i don't have any horses that do anything for a living anymore um those are good ones and most of them were were trail riding horses and stuff and and everybody just quit trail riding so they but uh i shoe for a, a wealthy guy that used to own a lot of uh uh stuff out in odessa but he moved to quartz canna so i still make a long trip he doesn't want to trade horseshoers i said you could probably find somebody a whole lot cheaper in this area but <laughs> but he still has me he pays me to drive out there and still uh do his horses how far so, of a drive is quartz canna about Man. four hours yeah oh, dang. <laughs> well pretty if you're getting paid to, to do it yeah yeah he pays me pretty good so i still drive out there yeah he bought up most of the town of Eureka. Eureka, Texas, yeah. Bought the marina and the stores and all kinds of stuff out there. Yeah. Must be nice having that kind of money. I guess you yeah, just buy a whole damn town. Want, yeah. <laughs> Bought up the town. Yeah, that's yeah. a wild <clears throat> deal. Mm. Just be a little poor. Like, yeah, I guess I'll buy it all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, and then I'm going to name myself the every, mayor. Everything going through his name now out Jeez. there. Yeah. Um, wow. <clears throat> <laughs> you see, you see, you, you see, like kind of like the type of guy from like the time I've known you is you go all in when you're kind of doing something. Oh yeah, you know, like you're oh, like for shooting sure. a little yeah. bit. All right, yeah. Well, I'm gonna shoot four miles. <laughs> right, but, 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 but once, but once I take a little break, then I'm gonna take a little break. But uh, yeah, but that's the way I've always been. And I don't it seems know why, like that way into the night. Like you like just that. don't make like. It's yeah. never just kind of a plain knife. Like yeah. it's always no, no, and, it, and it's kind of. And, and some guys probably enjoy just making the same boring knife over and over and over. But I, I, I probably will never be like that. I, I try to outdo myself, you know. Yeah, what's the test in that if you're to, making the same to, thing, uh, right? Try to, you know, if I impress myself, then maybe I'll impress somebody else, you know, and, and do something different with each. Is that one. your goal then? Each yeah. knife is you're just trying to make something you think's cool. Yeah, yeah, usually. Yeah, I try and try and do something. You know, I get wild ideas and 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 then uh I try and do something that I've I, you know, challenge myself and uh like that last knife like this this knife here. This is I don't think I've ever seen anybody do anything like this, but actually put like 
a twist. I don't know if I have the right light lighting on it. But you may you just have to here. send me a picture yeah. of that, and then I can put it up. Yeah, yeah you see that twist on the yeah. uh, on the buoy? That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah, yeah on the on the handle there. So How long did it take you to make that knife? I probably made it in about. Uh, I made it in sessions. You know, knife making is kind of session making. You know, you got to make each step and then put them all together. But but probably probably only only got maybe uh, twenty or thirty hours in it. Maybe tops. Yeah, depends on uh, depends on uh, you know all the breaks in between. You it's know, still a ton. So, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, if you was to actually add up the time that you you worked worked on it, you know, and you, Shane Carter once said, you know, he sells a knife, you know, something like that for about twenty five hundred. So that's always been my kind of goal. But but uh, but I I think uh, I've sold quite a few of them for you know fifteen hundred or two thousand somewhere in there. I'm no Shane Carter, but Shane Carter makes some awesome awesome knives. Now that he got his master smith, he always has. I still have my first Shane Carter knife when i won the world championship he donated one to the uh, calgary oh, cool. and and uh so I, I treasure that one he would he would probably be embarrassed by it today but but uh <laughs> but it was it was it was uh an awesome knife to me still is yeah yeah i bet yeah, yeah. i'd kind of like to see that to be honest oh yeah yeah it's down at the other house I'll trying to send you a picture of it yeah yeah that'd be cool yeah, that, he donated that donated that one in 2007 to calgary yeah one of his one that was one of his first up and coming knives when he started getting into the knife yeah making. he seemed yeah. kind of like one of the first ones to start making damascus and making some uh-huh. bowie knives and stuff like that and then yeah 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 and he got it he got us kind of interested in it me and dad and and then we started having clinics out here and it went it went uh uh pretty haywire there we got we we learned a lot and Started getting more tricks of the trade, and then now Dad's into spurs, man. He's is he? Spur is that what he's fool. doing a bunch of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's getting into the spur making. He's trying to trying to drag me down that rabbit hole, but I don't know if I want to go down. The, <laughs> I was just about to ask. You think you're gonna be doing it? Yeah. I like yeah. This, I like spurs more than I like <laughs> knives. Oh man, he's he's spurs all up in them. Yep, trying better. to. He's going to I was <laughs> going to getting clinics and and all kinds of stuff. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, Matt Humphrey's yep. one of the best spur makers we know. Lives right down the road. Yeah, so, Matt yeah. and Troy Flaherty. You guys, you guys are so blessed in the bit and spur world of Texas. Yeah. We we have a lot of, of people that know what they're t- they're doing. Not that don't no, live too far got away. Clapper, Matt. Yeah. Like you, you guys have Troy. Like a lot of them. A lot of them. Not to mention yeah. Glenn Pointer. <laughs> right next door. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Grumpy. Yeah. We got Grumpy lives next door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Old Grumpy. <laughs> uh, he is, but he makes some of the best exactly. saddle hardware in the world. <laughs> like like yeah. the most sought after hardware yeah. there pretty much is. Like, yeah. It's yeah. a crazy deal. Mm-hmm. So where do you think you're going to go with yeah, the knife making? Do you think you're just going to keep going down the Bowie? Yeah, I, I like uh, – you know, I, I can still count on both hands how many pocket knives I've made. I, I uh, I'm starting to 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 get to get it a little bit more, but but uh, but man, those little screws and pocket knives they're just annoying uh, to all get out. And so I, I prefer making buoys or hunters or whatever. But uh, uh, they're a lot more uh, you know uh, headache less uh, and uh, and try and put something cool into every knife that I make that uh, nobody's seen before, but but uh, but yeah, pocket knives are cool. But uh, but you got to kind of have the right clientele for pocket knives, you know. And, and having having people that uh, will pay that kind of money, because uh, a lot of people th- uh, think of pocket knives as not being worth as much, but they actually oh, take yeah. three times as long, you know. I bet. And so so yeah, you got to have that right clientele, like you know a a, a Bill Rupel or a, or a Bubba Crouch, uh, you know clientele. They make trappers and they. They make six thousand yeah. dollar trappers, you know, and you know most people think a trapper is only you know worth a hundred dollars, but yeah, they <laughs> they take yeah, a lot. I, of time I carry too. I carry an Aaron Wilburn <laughs> trapper. Like, oh, there you go. And people like yeah. they always think like, oh, is that an old case knife? And it's like not quite. <laughs> nah, 
No, I got a little, it's a little bit different. Better than that. I feel yeah. guilty with my pocket, <laughs> but like, it's, no, it's it's a different world, and yeah. it's like I had I had that trapper by Aaron before I saw I went to that clinic that is a I I was at the winter clinic and I stopped by your guys' shop and you guys had Rick and Bill in there making folders and that was like oh, yeah. an eye opener yeah. of what Oof. flat really is yeah. and like what these things are really moving together that's that's something of the yeah. knife making that it's yeah. just like I, I i i have a rough time with it's like as a horseshoer like we're getting down to a 16th or a 30 second that's pretty precision yeah well yeah we're yeah we're, we're like right. the knife yeah. making <laughs> world something down there. It has to be right with those pocket knives, or it Man, will not even work. with those yeah. like Bowie knives. Yeah. Like when I see you post, like that one you just showed us, like all I could think of was all the flat, the junctions. Yeah, yeah. It it's uh, there's a lot of different ways you can put on handles for those Bowie knives, and uh, and I tell you who's making some of the best Bowies right now is Kelly Vermeer. Uh, she's making some awesome Bowies and. And, uh, and I learned uh, a lot uh, from her and, and some other people uh, putting those, those hidden frames on. You know, it's all about how you put the, uh, the screw on and, and all that, 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 uh, um, that you can do like a, like a pommel screw or a screw inside the frame to be able to get the stars and the hidden frame all the way around. And, uh, and there's lots of different ways you can, you can assemble the, the handle to a buoy. And uh, and allows you to get the Damascus to shine in different places, and and uh, and so that that that's really interesting. And a lot of people, everybody loves buoys, and uh, but everybody loves pocket knives. And there's lots of hunters out there that that that, that like those hunters, but but it's uh, it's hard to, to to find the right clientele that that'll spend that kind of money. I, I prefer making the Damascus knives, and uh, you know because it it you can sand. Uh, you know, to about 220, even 400 grit, you know, uh, and, and, and most of the Damascus will shine pretty good, but some of those polished knives, you have to polish all the way to 2000, uh, or 3000 grit. And that takes a lot, a lot of time. And that's uh, all done hand them. sanding, ain't yeah. it? Hand sanding. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, 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 you know, I'm learning a little bit from Brian Burton, uh, lives down the road in Potosi. He's doing all his knives with just belts, you know, and just changing the belts out on grinders. And man, he brought a couple in here that had that uh, 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 Damascus, it was, or what do they call that stuff? It's like uh, stainless yeah. Damascus, and, um, and and he did everything on a belt and uh, and and no hand sanding. I mean, it just looks as mirror finishes all get out, hmm. and that just takes talent to be able to do that just right off the grinder. Yeah. But apparently you can do it. Yeah. So do you foresee yourself kind of like going through? There's a certification process, right? But being a bladesmith, does it go like journeyman and then to master? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to be a member for two years uh, before you can apply for the journeyman. Uh, and I think I got all uh, membershiped up, and then and then once you take your journeyman. And then you have to uh, wait two more years before you can take what your all master's. What do you have to do yeah. to so do you the think journeyman? The journeyman, I think you just have to have five knives. And uh, one of the main rules is they have to be over six-inch blades. And um, uh, um, and then you just have uh, good quality knives. I don't think there's any set rules as a journeyman other than they have to be over six inches. Um, and, but there's a lot of rules in the, in the master smiths. Uh, you have to make a certain kind of dagger with a, uh, with a handle, you know, Kelly's making hers right now. And she got, oh, uh, Horgan, uh, to, uh, to, uh, teach her how, how to do that. And, um, and then, uh, I think you have to have a bunch of certain criteria with the master as well. Could but, they uh, all be yeah. Damascus or? I think you can have them either way. They don't have to be in Damascus, but yeah. Uh, but uh, well, just from yeah. what you were just explaining there, how you like making the Damascus because you don't have yeah. to hand sand. Yeah, I would definitely like... do it in Damascus if I end up taking getting that far in the Masters and the in the journeyman. But I'm sure I'll I'll get into it and and take them one of these days. But I'm not I'm not in a big hurry. Yeah. 
Yeah. And uh, right right now, uh, the priority is just getting my shop uh, built and having a place to to make knives. And and once we get all settled in, we'll we'll worry about doing all the journeymen and masters and stuff nice. like that. Yeah. Yeah, that'll be cool. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I bet you can do it. Oh, uh, well, thanks for <laughs> giving it a go. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> some of you kind of mentioned to me earlier about uh, with the pistol shooting. So that's yeah. something that kind of interests me as well. Um, how long did you do that for? And like, were you actually like going to actual, like, did they have like competitions and. Yeah, we did it for about, uh, we did it for at least five, five or six years. You know, dad at first got into the three gun and I never did get into the three gun. That's a very expensive sport and you got to have bullets for all three guns and, and you're changing from a pistol to a shotgun to an AR and oh. and and, then, uh, and they was going uh, uh, and you're going to shoot you know uh, anywhere from 20 to to uh, to 100 rounds out of each one of those guns per stage you know so you can imagine how much money they were going through on bullets you know oh, yeah. to go shoot a match and and so I I uh, I didn't I was still um, doing my thing on that but then they they decided just to get into the pistol shooting which is uh, the United States Pistols Association USPSA and uh they and we got into the open gun stuff and the nine millimeter and the limited gun and it's all uh you can have like limited 10 where you only have like 10 rounds in a magazine and we even got into the revolver speed shooting for a while you know jerry micklick the famous revolver shooter uh, everybody yeah. wanted to be like jerry and shoot the revolvers but nobody could shoot yeah. near as fast as jerry <laughs> 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 um uh, uh open gun was a lot of fun because you could have you know, 30 rounds in a magazine, you know, of nine millimeter and, uh, and, and it's really fast shooting with a, with a dot, a Seymour, Seymour dot, uh, up on top of your gun. And you would have like a, uh, a break on the end of your gun. So there would be, uh, no recall whatsoever. Like the gun would just like do do shoot twice and never even hardly move. And, um, and, and we would shoot the steel and the paper two shots in the paper and knock all the steel down as fast as you could. And I made it to C class. I think, uh, dad made it to, to B class and it would go like, uh, you would go C and then B and A and then, and then, uh, and then once you go to A, you go master and then grandmaster in the, in the pistol shooting world. So, uh, we, we, we seen some master class and grandmaster set burn down some stages and, and, you know, and you think you just did it really fast in about 10, 12 seconds, you know, and, and a grandmaster go in there and he did it all in like seven seconds, you know. Wow. And you're like, how did the, it, the gun sounded like it never yeah. even stopped shooting, you know, just da, 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 and then everything's done and done, you know. You're like, <laughs> I mean, seven seconds, yeah, this is like. Always somebody faster. Yeah. Yeah. That could shoot the whole stage. But yeah, it was a lot of, a lot of fun, a lot of fun. We burned through a lot of bullets. We bought fancy loading machines load all of our own ammo and um and that way we could save save on uh, <laughs> on rounds and so it was the only way to do it was to, to load your own ammo lots of pistol bullets how, yeah. how many like do you have a guess on how many bullets you guys shoot a weekend well you would shoot a minimum of 150 to 200 per 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 uh match yeah wow so so yeah yeah <laughs> Because each stage would be would be twenty five or thirty <laughs> minimum, you know. Yeah, yeah, and you got five, at least five or six here stages. I, I feel so. if I shoot three boxes yeah, gonna, to my rifle a year, I'm doing all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm staying on right. top of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did you say yeah. a year? Yeah, <laughs> Riley. No, a year. Or a week. Like, yeah. Yeah. If I put sixty <laughs> rounds through my hunting rifle in the year, like five of those are might be an oh, animal. Yeah. You know, it's like. The, the rest well, are just going right. to be it, at least it, only five and the rest of them might yeah, be just checking like, zero trips, on it. Yeah. Like, man, I fell <laughs> a few times on that bastard. <laughs> I, I wish you'd shoot it and make yeah. sure to still hit something. But it's like, I'm, not, I'm never shooting past 500 yards at something that's, you know, first shot. Like that's going to, it's going to be not near as far as Bill's shooting. <laughs> well, <laughs> different world, but, so what else you guys want to know? 
What do you think was the so going back to Calgary? What uh-huh. do you think was like the uh, the toughest thing in preparation for that competition? Uh, the prep, you know, is figuring out how much time you had and how much how much uh, time you would, you know. I would have those those guys that were on the team with me, and they were going like, "How are we going to get done with this bill in, in time and, and have any time to to uh, to clean up?" And so, what I would do is normally I would I would have a go. Like I think the the hardest thing I've ever seen at Calgary was the uh, the uh, double cocking eight nail roadster with a with a toe clip and a jumped on toe grab in 50 minutes a pair of them in Calgary. Oh and, shit! And then, so the guys were like. Dude, we're not, we, we can't even jump a tow bar on in that time, you know. And, and so I made two of the biggest dog crap you'd ever saw in about 30 minutes and just whooped them out. And they had all the elements. It was all there. It looked like I just turned up the piece of half by one on the end for Cox. They were the most gnarliest things you'd ever saw. But, hey, I went, look, now I got 20 minutes to rest. <laughs> yeah. And they were like. <laughs> but they were welded they were on there and i said now now we have 20 minutes to rest and clean them up and uh, and they laughed and i said well it's the truth you know i i ended up winning that class and jim quick was second and that that was one of the most gnarliest uh to be able to get done uh i've ever seen at calgary yeah and uh but most people didn't get you know tow bars jumped on and and this and, was an individual uh, all, class. All about getting the elements, you know, the elements and the size, and uh, and and then you know, and it was a pairs class because they were judged, they were judged individually. Because Jim Quick won one shoe and I won the other shoe, and then Jim Quick was like third with the other shoe and I was second with the other shoe. So it ended up putting me first because they they judged them as a pair, but they also judged them separately. Yeah, it was crazy yeah. the way that they judged that. Yeah, worked yeah. out that. <clears throat> but, what would you consider to be um, your favorite thing about when you had competed at Calgary? Like, what was probably the more fun class that you got to do? Uh, speed shoe, man. There was nothing funner than doing the speed shoe. They would always give us, like, this normal little front with a toe clip, three-quarter fullered, six nails, and, and 12 minutes or, or 10 minutes or nine minutes. You know, they, they kept making it a little bit smaller and – and I won that a couple of times, and that was that was one of the funnest things ever. Was was they would say go, and you had 12 minutes, and you needed to knock out the best front shoe you could ever knock out in a Coke Forge as quick as possible. Yeah, yeah. And, and we used to like three heat them and then put a little bit of rasp on it and get it to size and throw it on the ground and hope you were the winner. Yeah, <laughs> but, pretty uh, similar to the match yeah, play concept uh, then. Yeah, uh, the. Uh, the the thing about Calgary was was it was you know all about elements usually um, and getting all the functions there and you know and sometimes you would be like you would throw one down it had all the elements and you would think that that one uh, wasn't going to get a smidgen and then you were taking your time on the one you thought you know you was going to get first place and this one wouldn't even get a smidgen and you would win this other shoe that you you threw down real quick so it, you know it's it was it was never about how good your shoe was. It was about how the elements and everything fit into size in the box and everything. Yeah, and uh, it and you know always the one that you thought, oh, this is a good looking shoe. And you, they, they wouldn't even get a look, and the other one would win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's craziness. Yeah, but but yeah, one of the hottest times was one year. It was like a hundred and twenty degrees in that tent. And we had to make a, uh, a, a, a Fullard Hill to Hill heart bar and a European bar shoe in 50 minutes. And, uh, and, uh, and I was in between heats. Uh, I was dipping my whole body in the water bucket and then coming back out. And, then do it, and, then do it, and the water would run it on my wells of my heart bar and off my head and on there. And I just making the loudest popping sound you ever heard. Boom! You know, but I just kept going, and everybody was hooping and hollering in the stage, and, uh, and I ended up winning that class, both shoes. <laughs> <laughs> just dunking into the water and coming back dunking out. Dunking in the water the whole time, just to try to stay cool. I was sweating so bad. It was so hot. Yeah. Because there was a big audience no. usually at Calgary, too, right? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes we would have, you know, uh, I don't know uh, what you call big, but, you know, I seen a couple times there was like 100 yeah. people in the stands. Yeah. They would kind of come in the publicly and, and watch. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. For a horseshoe yeah. contest. Yeah. yeah. It's uh-huh. something that I wish, like, even if Spruce Meadows, you know, happens, it still won't. Like, I, I'm not trying to, like, t- take anything away. It's like it won't be like Calgary, you know, it won't be at the Calgary stampede. Like that would have been a really cool thing but, to see as a contest at the stampede. But what would be cool to see is, is you guys actually taking your podcast show on the road and, and doing a little, a little live deal while you're down yeah. there over it. You know, That's, we're going to do that for the first awesome. time at uh, the winter clinic down at well shot. There's going to be a bunch awesome. of people there awesome. so we can have okay. kind of a, a live show going on there. It'll be pretty fun. Heck yeah. 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 Are you going to make it up there for the winter clinic? or? Yeah. I doubt it. I doubt it, guys. I'm going to stay home and I'm going to stay, uh, make a few knives no and get this shop down. built and have me a place to, I got me a place to live. Now I just yep. need a place to work and uh, you don't have to, to uh, come over here and borrow <laughs> daddy's shit all the time. <laughs> I will tell you, though, um, you know, I haven't necessarily got to work with you a bunch, but the, couple of years ago when they had the winter clinic at your dad's shop there you know yeah. i was having trouble making heel caulks and yeah. you know i just came up to you and asked like hey you mind help me and you were right there and you showed me how to make heel caulks yeah. and you know awesome. it still helps me to this day yeah. like i've always always been always been that way i've always wanted to try and help everybody i kind of learned that from grant moon growing up is as you know grant moon will would never hide anything. I've met a lot of people out there that, that they're, were always sneaky and they wouldn't want to show you anything. Great hands, great guys. You know, uh, I won't mention any names, but, you know, some of them we spent a lot of good time with, you know, Austin Edens and Mark Milster. But, you know, they're not going to show you two just enough to get you by. But, you know, they're, they're, they're going to kick your butt because they're really good hands. But Grant Moon and, and me and a couple other guys I know, we were always there that would show you the very, you know, everything that we would know, and we would rather beat you on your best day than, than you know, and if we didn't, then, then, but then you deserve to win. But, but I'm always, always there to help and show you everything that I know. And maybe, it'll, you know, Sawyer come down just the other day, and, and, uh, and I have, I haven't seen Sawyer in a while, but, but I told him, you know, I, I haven't made heart bars in a while, but I'll show you how I made them back in the day, and maybe you'll pick up something. And you know what, I made. You know, a hunk of dog crap in a, in a few minutes for him. That the way I used to make heart bars, and he got something out of it, and he whooped out like three crackers right back to back. You know, yeah. and uh, and I and he said, "What? You showed me a couple of things there, Bill, that I wasn't doing, and it helped him. You know, do really good. I mean, I think he only got like ten plates, but <coughs> he did good in that in that class and helped him helped him get along. You know, so it's something I've kind of thought about." Yeah. quite a bit actually you know like you pick up little tidbits yeah. from each person you know to help fit into right. your style you know like right. you're not necessarily going to gain all your information from this one right. person and you know exactly yeah. mimic what they're doing but if you can gather yeah. a bit from bill a bit from jim a bit from right. craig riley and then develop help it into you your make, own help style you make yours a little faster you know that's that was always the, the 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 gain was was being able to make something fast and and then and then improve improve on it uh, from there, you know. Um, mm-hmm. And whenever I was competing, because I always felt like if I could get it done as fast as possible, then I would have more time than everybody else to rasp and 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 f- check my nail holes, go back through them, and clean the shoe up, make it flat. You know, that was always my my key to success was was uh, was being able to get that thing all whooped out to where I had more time than everybody else to get it all cleaned up. Yeah. It sounds like you're going back to the yeah. basics is what you're coming down to. Your nails yeah. flat. Yeah. You know, the basic elements. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, that's something I need to work on when I'm making shoes is I'll get caught up in the making of the shoe and not the right. end goal right. like hurry up and get to the end goal, you know. Well, yeah, but also there's some things that you can't go back and fix. So it's always important, like, you know, you know, certain issues, you know, making the old famous roadster. If you get in a hurry in the beginning, then it's not going to be a very good roadster in the end. You know, you got to kind of forge out those ends and, and put those hillcocks on right because you can't fix them once they're turned. 
They, they have yeah. to be all done in the straight. Yeah. Certain things like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those have been lessons that I've been learning more and more lately. <laughs> it's like we've been making a bunch of <laughs> bunch of roadsters, just... and you're like, "Fuck! If I don't do this in the boomerang, yeah, it is a it's a hunk yeah, of shit." <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, you, you turn it, and it's like, "Oh, oh that ain't coming back for, out." For you me, know? it's yeah. usually <laughs> that spot in between, like the first and third toenails, you know, on the inside rim. There's just like this hunk of crap right. there that you're like right. trying to get back this whole entire, like yeah. make it into a nice section. It's like, man, yeah. that is a struggly spot for me. Oh yeah. Hard. Oh yeah. Yeah. I find mine is, uh, you know, Riley gets a nice, like where it covers the heel buttress right there. You know, I'm having uh -huh. a hard time to like make mine have like a nice check into it where it flows right. onto the heel, you know, to match uh -huh. his. And that's kind of one thing I've, find myself struggling on the heel caulk side with them they're hard oh yeah oh yeah that was a, that was the thing you know back in the i think it was like 1999 I, I moved to oklahoma after i'd been shoeing horses for three or four years out here and moved in with mark milster and every night that's all we did was challenge each other was back and forth who was who was going to beat each other making a roadster tonight you know and uh and uh you know hill cox and and that was we would just you know feed off each other so that's always a good thing if you ever get you know practice partner and just kind of you know feed yeah, that's off huge one, one another yeah. can you can you like mm -hmm. go back it's like what were you looking for in a heel cock yeah. like what like yeah. when you guys were like having your little competitions what was the winning factors oh yeah well, with, you know, having that caulk in line with travel and having that, that sexy, sexy caulk and getting no coal shut behind, you know, it, a lot of, you know, back then it was really easy to fold over too much steel and too fast, you know, and you'd always get that, that cold check in there. And, and, uh, so we was always, you know, uh, if you, you know, if you did it so bad that you couldn't get it rasp out, then, you know, you were, you were, a, it yep. was kind of a failure. So the little butt always, crack on the foot surface. Yeah, you oh made. yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the pack. <clears throat> so packing enough steel in there and being able to, to 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 get it to look like a a, you know, perfect heel cock, that was always the goal. <clears throat> yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sure uh, you've judged quite a few competitions over the years, haven't you? Oh, I I used to go to all of them. You know, uh, that was a, from about, I guess from about. Uh, 90, 95 to about 2008, I was probably at a competition every other weekend somewhere. Yeah. Going. Yeah. No, did you like to, uh, did you like to judge competitions? Uh, yeah, I, I've, uh, I judged, uh, a, a, a few. Um, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a, uh, you know, I'm not, uh, as rich as my daddy, so I haven't been able to donate very much or, or give free stuff. But uh, you know, I would I would I would definitely have to have to have my uh, my uh, expensive paid for. But I would absolutely love to judge any competition or, or do anything. But you know, I just have to have a little bit of money to be able to get there and and and, uh, and uh, pay for my pay for my weekend trip. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> you know. Well, Bill, kind of a question I've been asking, um, you know, all our guests is. Who would be on your Mount Rushmore? And with the Mount Rushmore, it kind of means uh, who would be four people that you like look up to and have idolized over the year or really respect and think have helped you out along your way? Oh, oh man, there's the, the list is way more than a Mount Rushmore can hold. But you know, I, I've been a pretty pretty fortunate and pretty lucky lad because uh, I have had some of the best uh guys in the world around me most of my life and uh so it it's been it's been very cool a very uh uh great ride and hope to just take take it on on forward but you know you know my my dad is definitely gonna be on on my mount rushmore and then uh um uh, i would definitely uh you know bill burke uh master smith he's always been there for me uh he would definitely uh be there for because i can you know i can call him up any other day of the week something about a knife and you know he's going to answer it for me so you know mm -hmm. he's kind of my my go-to and um and i would definitely uh you know uh as far as the uh you know 
I don't know, man. The list could go. It's a hard forever. question. But, but you know, it's that is a very, very hard, hard question. Uh, I've had so many uh, good, good help over the years, and um, but you know, as far as uh, you know, I don't really. I've been out of the out of the horseshoe and you know competition world. You know, uh, haven't really looked back since 2008. So I kind of lost contact with a lot of you know. Not really lost contact, but you know. Uh, the guys that I used to compete against and, and everything, you know, we're still still great friends and everything. I even still talk to Beanie every now and then, you know. Uh, but, uh, but you know, he was always my uh, my guy that, you know, the, the nemesis to try and beat Beanie, you know. He, Beanie was the hand, yeah, you know. Is. Still is. Oh, yeah. And, uh, still is. Still going. Yeah. Still going. And, uh, but, uh, um, but, yeah, definitely uh, – one of, the, one of the greats was old Kirk Cottle, and, uh, you know, if I could bring him back, you know, he was definitely be on my, my Mount Rushmore, too, as, as well. Yeah. yeah don't, I was talking with don't Todd feel Walker. Don't having four. Gavin yeah. only answered two of them himself. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> well, I, you, know, you know, those guys, they pushed me to no end, you know. Austin Edens and Todd Walker and Billy Reed, uh, those were – those were those were my guys, John McNerney. Yeah. You know, uh, we we had we shared a lot a lot of good times together, and and uh, and uh, being on those uh, those teams that we were, and, you know, uh, I would think I was the only one of the only guys to ever get kicked off the American Ferris team. <laughs> <laughs> but Todd Walker, I told him he had some big shoes to fill, fill, and he come in there and he got her dead, you know, and and uh, yeah, I, I was. Uh, I was not very uh, – uh, um, one night, I, I can't remember what happened, but I ended up oversleeping for team practice. And, oh, and, boy. Uh, they, thought it was, they thought it was time for me to take a little break, so, so I did. But I think we ended up coming back and, uh, and doing the team a couple more times after that. But, but uh, the WCB was probably one of my, my favorite, favorite moments back in 2008 when we won the very first one that, uh, that Craig – Went around with his truck, and that was a oh, yeah. that was big fun. Yeah, that's a big accomplishment too, Bill. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hope he has some sort of museum or or, or something one day with uh, with all the all the archives and the winners over the years of yeah. his uh, competition. That'll be I'm cool. I'm sure he will. Yeah. Well, Bill, we appreciate you taking the time and uh, chatting with us tonight. Man, I, I appreciate it very much, guys, and. Uh, and uh thanks for having me yeah yeah man it's been great to catch up and uh you know i i learned something just about the long range oh, you know yeah. shooting just because i'm not much yeah. of a you know gunsmith <laughs> or whatever you want to call it myself so um, you guys can call me anytime y'all know that and we got our little message deal there so anything you need just just holler and we'll yeah man we appreciate that it. thank yeah. you very much yeah all right, yep. guys. Well, have a good evening, and look forward to seeing the the, the deal. Yeah did we have did we have anybody come watch no, us? No, it's not live. Yeah, it's just recorded. Oh, yeah. it's not live. Oh, okay, all right. So, but yeah, that's how you you just put it on there after you edit it out. Yeah, the good exactly. the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ah. Yeah, we'll get you up. Uh, you'll be up on Wednesday next week. All right, all right, so guys. Can, uh... Thanks a lot. All right, Bill. Yeah. Sounds good, Bill. Thank you.